our first time here, and I do hope that it will not be our last, getting to see some of your most magnificent city. I hope it won't be my last because during my brief time here, I've enjoyed India's famous gift of hospitality. And the next time, I would love to be able to see more of your sights. I'd love to be able to see the Taj Mahal with my husband, Todd, considering how patient he has been and patiently enduring my political career the last couple of decades and been so supportive, I think it would be nice to reinforce our teamwork, our commitment before that monument of eternal love. So Todd, being with us here tonight, I, I promise you that next time we're in India, that will be one of the places that we head. Okay, can't wait to see the Taj Mahal. Folks, when I had the honor of meeting your Prime Minister back in 2008, I expressed my admiration for your country's rich history and your culture and your most recent achievements that have just so transformed India. And I am now humbled with this opportunity to get to express to you personally those sentiments in this beautiful ancient land. This that has so captured the imaginations of artists and poets and explorers throughout human history. Todd and I are honored to be here to see the site of some of the world's oldest civilizations, some of the birthplaces of, of major religions, and the crossroads of the ancient Spice Route and Silk Road. And it was those resources, all those years ago, those precious resources of their day, the spices and pepper and silk and indigo. My country was essentially discovered when, during the age of exploration, Western Europeans were looking for a route to your country in order to enjoy and exchange those resources. Yes, the connection between our countries was there from the beginning. During the flight here between our two countries, it didn't escape me that Japan lies in between my home state of Alaska and your beautiful country of India. I trust that you will join me in expressing solidarity with the Japanese people as they recover from those most horrific, tragic events of recent. Their determination and their resiliency won't fail them. And the world does stand united with that community in the land of the rising sun. They, what they're going through and their, their attitudes, their, their, their respect for one another, their humbleness and their graciousness and still their appreciation for life shows us that life is precious, life is fragile, and we're all in this together and may Japan know that our collective caring heart is with them at this time, and may we all learn from their resiliency and their humble, cooperative spirits. Now, yes. I have been asked to speak today about my vision for America, my vision of America, and a little bit about my background. I grew up in a very small town, perhaps like some of you, though half a world away, my town is tucked between two grand mountain ranges in a valley quite far from the avenues of power. There in my home state of Alaska, we are so proud of nature's beauty and our towering mountains, but certainly here, relatively near the Himalayas, I, I think uh, I can appreciate even more of nature's enormity being here in India. One of the mountains near my home I see it every day from my kitchen window. It's called Pioneer Peak. And Pioneer Peak was named in honor of the brave pioneers who settled our valley just a few generations ago. By the sweat of their brow and rugged work ethic, they turned raw land into valuable agriculture communities. And I have loved my upbringing in Alaska. I'm from a very big family. Todd's from a big family. We've created our own big family now. I was a school teacher's kid, loved sports, loved anything in the great outdoors, outdoor recreation. Even the jobs I chose would um, ideally be something to, that had to do with working with my hands in the great outdoors, as were Todd's chosen vocations. I tell my parents that the greatest gift that they ever gave me was that upbringing 
in Alaska, the young 49th state of our 50 United States. Alaska is known as the last frontier, and it is a place that is rugged, and you can still feel an optimistic, pioneering spirit there, like the spirit that Americans had in order to carve a nation out of the wilderness. It was a pioneer spirit that brought pioneering families to the land. And these pioneer families were strong and hopeful, and they made a good life, not an easy life, but a good life for themselves in the northern wilds. And it was that pioneering spirit that shaped me. That pioneering spirit instilled in me a sense of independence and self-reliance and a belief in the power of ordinary people. Ordinary people working together in order to help one another. In a small community in such a vast state, and Alaska is vast, we're about half the size of all of India, you learn to help your neighbor and you learn to help yourself. And you learn to value and to have faith in personal freedom, especially the freedom to chart your own course. So it was there that I learned that there's no limit to what you can achieve, achieve with hard work, strong work ethic. That optimism and respect for and empowerment of individual liberty shaped both my personal beliefs and my political beliefs and also my vision for my country. And I started in politics on the local level two decades ago, inspired by a desire to just serve the ordinary folks in my hometown. First as a city councilman, and then as a city mayor, I led the fastest growing area of our state, and I experienced firsthand the power and the success of the free market and the proper role of government in our lives. How the proper role of government can foster economic growth. I cut property taxes, and I invited businesses into our town. And what I focused on was basic infrastructure, building roads and water and sewer, and wasn't a lot of uh, glamour in that kind of job, but again, with a firm belief in what government's proper role is in our lives, it really isn't necessarily glamorous. It's not government's business to spend the working man's tax dollars recklessly, and certainly not government's business to centrally plan an economy and control an entrepreneurial spirit. That just doesn't work. Government should lay infrastructure and level the playing field, and then essentially government needs to just get out of the way and allow the private sector to grow and to thrive and create jobs and generate wealth. Then, as governor of my state, my goal was to clean up corruption and to develop our rich natural resources, our abundant oil, and gas and minerals are rich and robust fisheries in Alaska. And an important project there was a center point. It was jump-starting a natural gas pipeline project that had been stalled for decades. We brought all the stakeholders together for mutual benefit. Our state, the energy industry, our neighboring country, consumers, and together with ordinary citizens who Per our constitution in our state, the ordinary citizens are the resource owners. We brought these people together with the energy producers who bid on the right to produce our resources, and Alaska finally then was able to move forward on a project, a huge project, that can help lead America towards energy independence. Through my work in Alaska as an oil and gas regulator, and then as our governor, I've seen firsthand how energy development and job creation and national security are linked. Affordable, reliable energy access to that is the key to economic growth, which is the key to job growth. Securing that stable domestic supply of fuel will lead to more peaceful and prosperous America, an America that's not subject to the whims of foreign dictators who could cut off energy supplies and can use energy as a weapon as they would seek to control. Of course, energy issues are critical to the whole world's stability and to economic opportunities. By 2030, the world's energy consumption will increase by 50%, and half of that 
will come from India and China. We all face similar challenges in this energy arena, and this makes America's quest for energy independence and security all the more crucial as we seek to stabilize our economy and to secure our homeland and to cooperate with our allies who would seek peace on Earth. Energy is the key. My vision for a free and prosperous America has much to do with energy. Now, we hear a lot about green energy today, and I'm a true believer in environmental conservation and responsible stewardship of the land. Remember, I live in Alaska, the pristine environment. I don't want to mess it up. That, that pristine environment that we can pass on to generations, I, I don't want to mess it up. I am a conservationist. I married an Alaska native into, into this family of Todd's where their connection to the land with their Yupik Eskimo heritage has really reinforced my respect for God's creation. And we've made our living off the land. As was explained, Todd is a commercial fisherman and then for years he had worked in the oil fields up on the north slope of Alaska. So I'm, as a conservationist, in favor of an all of the above approach to energy security. But all of the above means that we're going to have conventional resources too. That means the kind that we actually use to reliably fuel our economy. That means crude oil, for example, and natural gas, and our coal, and our nuclear power. Unfortunately, though, some have stymied resource development, like responsible domestic oil drilling. And as a result, hundreds of thousands of good American jobs are not going to be created until we change course. It means Americans get hit with huge gas prices at the pump unless we change course. And it means we're continuing to transfer hundreds of billions of US dollars to foreign regimes to purchase energy from them, regimes that do not have our best interests at heart. And I'm not just talking about gasoline here. Remember, petroleum products are all around you. Look at your everyday surroundings, your foodstuffs, the, the agriculture prod, products that are uh, grown with fertilizer, all the plastics that are around you, medical supplies, the transportation of all of these products. Remember that it's not just gasoline that increases as the price of crude increases. Everything is touched, basic commodities. So as government locks up land, and prohibits drilling, and we lose good jobs in the conventional resource arena, you may hear that it's green jobs that will be our savior. But look around the world. Try telling that to the thousands of English and Scottish workers who've lost jobs as a result of government investments in green energy projects. A recent UK study shows that for every green job created, Four jobs were lost elsewhere in the economy due to lack of affordable energy. Same story in Spain. Investment in green jobs brought massive debt and skyrocketing energy costs and 20% unemployment. This push for green energy at the expense of conventional, reliable sources is not a credible energy policy or economic policy. You know what it is? It's social engineering. It's social engineering by central government planners, and it leads to nothing more but more debt, more job loss, and taxpayers will be stuck subsidizing that failure and paying more for energy. But the good news is that we have a choice. There is another option. Instead of funding non-viable special interest projects, Americans can capitalize on our own viable resources that are right there at our doorstep. We can tap them. They're just waiting to be tapped. Their warehouse, billions and billions of barrels of oil right there, warehoused underground in Alaska. And so much natural gas, clean, green, affordable, easy to transport, abundant across the U.S. Whether used conventionally or to power natural gas cars, or to power uh, power plants to run those that charge electric cars. Natural gas is an ideal bridge fuel to the future. A future when renewables can someday become more reliant and economical and reliable. I warn Americans so often when I have the chance that it's a false utopian 
fairy tale told that would want you to believe that we don't need to drill for oil in the US. No, government manipulating energy supplies, manipulating any aspect of an economy, it leads to more people becoming more and more dependent upon government to meet their needs. It is social engineering to me. It's immoral, and it's a problem that we, the people, have got to be brave enough to tackle. One of our needs for energy independence, the reason, is that it is such a strategic challenge, and it's joined by another strategic challenge in our lives. And in America, that would be our unsustainable government debt, which hampers economic growth, too. And on this, there are no easy answers, but I think there are simple answers. We just need to apply the courage and the political will to confront the problem squarely. Obviously, we need to stop digging the hole that we are in there that has led to a $14 trillion national debt. We need to cut spending. We need to cut government back down to size and get rid of overly burdensome regulations. And most of all, we need job growth. We need job growth that won't come from top-down government planning. It's going to come from the free market. It's going to come from the ingenuity that is there in the free market. And that's by ordinary Americans, ordinary entrepreneurs who have a dream for a better life for them, for their families, to release the creative energy. Well, we need to do on a national level what our former president, Ronald Reagan, did back in the 1980s. It's what I believed in as a reforming mayor and a governor in my state. Because I want the free economic choices of ordinary men and women to power the marketplace, rather than distant bureaucrats thinking that they can plan and grow an economy by government decree, because that just doesn't work. And I know that you understand this, India, because in the early 1990s, due to clear, common sense, pro-free market reforms, India's economy took off. What you did in, in choices that were made were so wise, you abolished import licenses, you cut import duties, removed investment caps, and broke the union's grip on industry. You unleashed the creativity and the hard work of the Indian people. You turned away from a system where central government sets targets for all sectors of the economy, to a system that lets the market set its own targets. And that works. People no longer speak of India as a struggling economy as perhaps we would have 30 years ago. Today, we speak of India as a dynamic and vibrant in economy. And what you did was empower individuals. And in doing so, you reminded America of what made our country exceptional, that free entrepreneurial model that made our country great and prosperous, truly made America exceptional. See, if we unshackle the creative energy of our workers and entrepreneurs, there is no reason in the world that we can't get back to that rapid growth and prosperity. Friends, some people want to claim that the geopolitical scene has so changed that some would actually claim then America is in decline. The United States, they would say, will soon be a shadow of its former self. Well, I completely reject that. It represents wrong-headed thinking by some friends and wishful thinking by our enemies. It represents those who just don't understand America's foundation and where we can be again. America's demise has been predicted before. It didn't happen then. And it will not happen in the future. No, America is not in decline. But what is in decline is that idea of tax and spend, centralized bureaucracy that has brought America to the point of debt and deficits in the first place. These big government ideas are once again, thankfully, being consigned to the ash heap of history, though they won't go quietly to the grave. From the beginning, my faith has never been in big government. My faith is in the American people, and we are turning things around. Now, all great nations face the challenges that come with a changing economy, changing demographics, and new technologies. 
The nations that succeed in the face of these challenges are the ones that show innovation and ingenuity and will empower a free people. These qualities are the hallmarks of the American experience and the unique strengths of the American people. My vision for my country is an America that unleashes those strengths and confidently engages in leadership throughout the world. My vision for America is one that would welcome the healthy competition and the partnership of rising economic powers in a democracy like India. The relationship between our countries could shape the course of the next century, tilting it in the direction of free people, free markets. The future lies with us. We're half a world apart geographically, but we are connected with so much in common. We both have deep and historical democratic traditions, and we are the world's most diverse and tolerant and dynamic societies. Our peoples enjoy very close ties, and in recent years, our governments are finally catching up. There are a few limits to what India and America can do together to allow a more peaceful and prosperous world. Tragically, we both have been the targets of terrorism. We both have witnessed the courage of our people in combating terror, and we are both, we are both committed to seeing terrorism defeated. And we both want to ensure that China's rise is peaceful while hedging against risks that it could be otherwise. We both want to expand trade and investment with allies in a liberal international order that will soon boast India as its fastest growing major economy. Our diplomatic, military, and political ties are deepening because we have a genuine strategic partnership, but really it is our people who are driving this relationship. Indian entrepreneurs are investing in the U.S. even as U.S. businesses expand here. Indian students are throughout American universities and more Americans seek to study here, including through an expanded Fulbright scholarship program. Our tech companies are working together in impressive ways and our ethical partnerships could transform both our development trajectories. Our ties and our bonds are deep. And they're not driven so much by political summits and bureaucrats in these leadership conferences. They're driven by a free people and these free markets. And that's why I say that there are no natural limits to the future of U.S.-India relations. And that's why the world's largest democracies, not its largest autocracy, will lead the 21st century. We will lead because we are on the side of empowering individuals to make choices for themselves. Again, not government, not some new world order organization making decisions and decrees for us. We are on the side of religious tolerance and women's rights. And in recent years, India has so helped lead by example in the area of women's education by narrowing the gender gap in women's literacy. You've helped remind the world that a culture cannot advance when it holds back half its creative and intellectual power or its political power. I admire India's tradition of strong women leaders at home and abroad. And in fact, last year I had the honor of supporting a strong American woman of Indian descent when I endorsed the candidacy of South Carolina's new governor, their first female, Nikki Haley. I met Nikki's parents and was so impressed by their work ethic and their story and by Nikki's upbringing that led her to become part of a grassroots movement in America that in the introduction was explained to, as the Tea Party. And I'm proud to get to be a part of this movement as well. The Tea Party. It was named, of course, after that famous event in American politics that was a precursor to our independence Back in 1773, when American patriots were upset about British taxes, they dumped tea into the Boston Harbor. The British had forced a monopoly on uh, the American people that had prevented us from importing tea from anyone but the British East India Company. It's even back then, we believed in free trade. 
And today's Tea Party is a strong and vibrant movement in the U.S. and is only going to grow and become more and more influential. India Conclave, the theme of this conference even, remember it is changing balance of power. Well, the present day Tea Party in America, that's a perfect example of that. It's all about empowerment of ordinary, everyday, independent patriots who are rising up and making their voices heard in order to change the balance of power, to protect our United States Constitution and allow us to live out our Declaration of Independence. It reminds our central government that our Constitution gives great power to our 50 states and to individuals. And that these powers, these God-given rights, are not to be trampled on. The changing balance of power throughout the world today is driven by the empowerment of the individual and mankind's desire for freedom. That's what we're seeing across the world today, even as we speak. And the American people understand this, and I know that India understands this too. Back home in Alaska, where the fresh snow blankets the ground today, and my kids texted me to send me a report on what's going on around the house. They reported that they saw a mama moose and her two baby moose out by the wood pile down the driveway, and thinking about home this morning, remembering that there in my kitchen, I have a beautiful pencil drawing on my kitchen wall. It's a frame drawing by Robin Coran, and it's a picture of Mother Teresa of, Cal of Calcutta. She's holding a precious child, a baby, in this drawing. It was said of Mother Teresa that perhaps the greatest message she has given to the world is the value and dignity of human life. Understand the sanctity of life. From India, she was able to share this crucial message with the whole world. And it is a crucial message because the freedom and the empowerment of the individual is rooted in an understanding of every man and woman's inherent dignity and worth, that sanctity of life. I look at that picture, and I had looked at it even as I typed up the speech on my home computer there in the kitchen, and I was struck with this. Countries that would deny that message of individual worth and destiny of an individual, they inevitably stifle their own advancement because the fire of human progress is sparked by the aspirations of ordinary men and women seeking a better life. These simple working class aspirations, if you will, simple working class, what we want is a good job and a home and a good education for our children. That is what motivates economic progress and positive change. It is not bureaucrats, it's not central planners, it's not government decrees. Just hardworking men and women who are seeking the freedom to chart their own course and succeed by their own merits. And that is what India has been able to embrace and really make manifest with so many of the decisions made of late. When people realize even the briefest glimpse of this freedom and opportunity, they run to it. Even a hint that they can succeed through honest, hard work. Yes, they run to it. That is what they want to embrace. That's what they want to live for. They embrace the promise of better days ahead. They will sacrifice today for a better tomorrow for their children and for their grandchildren. But individual responsibility and drive and determination, with that, they, they will work together to carve a life for themselves out of the wilderness. They'll voluntarily contribute to help their neighbors, even neighbors half a world away. That's the optimistic, pioneering spirit of America's frontier. That's the spirit of India's progress, too. That's the connection with America and India. America has long been famous for our rags to riches stories, and now India is too, and be proud of that. It is so inspiring. Together as the world's largest democracies, we are a testament to the positive force of human aspirations. And today, all across the world, we see individuals, ordinary men and women, rising up and moving to advance, and it's fascinating to see a tool 
that's being used to move in this advancement is the new social media. Now, we don't know where all of this will lead, but we should look at it as opportunity to advance the cause of human freedom, not naively, but optimistically. Friends, our two democracies understand this struggle for freedom. It's the struggle of those who defiantly dumped tea in the Boston Harbor to protest a British tea tax. And it's the struggle of those who courageously marched to the seacoast near Dundee in order to make their own salt in defiance of a British salt tax. This hunger for freedom and opportunity is proof that what we call the American experience isn't just American, it's the universal dream of people everywhere. I believe that it is created within us. And that is where the March for Freedom has found its most eager advocates, ordinary people who have extraordinary determination to seek justice and make a better life for themselves, for their families. And this is as true in Alaska as it is in Andhra Pradesh. We have such a connection, half a world apart, and yet we are connected by this. My vision for America is one of a country that lives that dream and in turn inspires and empowers women and men around the world to live it too. We can lead by example. What America can show the world is what is possible, the potential of human possibilities when women and men are free. So yes, let us fight for that freedom. Yes, may we always be free. And again, India, I thank you so much for the invitation to be here. I say God bless you, thank you, and nothing but the very, very best to all of you, to this wonderful country. Thank you.